I'm sure many of you were like me. Over the last number of days, you were glued to your television screen, refreshing Facebook, looking for those updates, those uh, warnings, where the, where the storm was going to go. I don't know if you, you, you may have never heard of this. Maybe it's a local thing everyone knows about. I don't know. But I just discovered Frying Pan Tower. Anybody? Frying Pan Tower? Yeah? Okay. Frying Pan Tower. Yeah, I discovered Frying Pan Tower and uh, got a very interesting perspective of Hurricane Florence. Uh, this is a tower. If you don't know about it, it's, it's located about 30 miles uh, off the coast, south of us. Um, I believe it was once a, a military post, but it has been sold to a, a, a private owner who has turned it into a, a bed and breakfast of sorts. And, um, but he has a camera fixed on it that looks out to sea, and, and sure enough, as the hurricane came in, you could see the wind blowing and the waves uh, really look a, a horrifying scene. I don't know why anyone would ever want to, to build a boat and go sail out into that, but some of us here do for some reason. Um, only Jesus could call someone to that. That's, that's, the, that's right. Amen. <laughs> yeah, so as I was watching Frying Pan Tower and, and some of this other, other coverage, my, my mind couldn't help but go to, to Acts chapter 27, that well-known story about the Apostle Paul who was on a boat out at sea when a terrible storm came and before long they found themselves shipwrecked and stranded. I thought, let's, let's preach on that today. <laughs> Let's preach from Acts chapter 27 this morning. Of course, that, that, uh, that whole sequence of events that, that really begins back in chapter 21 comes on the, the, the end of Paul's third missionary journey. So he's, he's completed his third journey. He returns back to Jerusalem, and basically what's awaiting him at the temple in Jerusalem is an angry mob, a group of people who sees him, take him prisoner, and as the, the, as the events go through, through chapters 21 and 22, all the way really to the end of, of Acts, uh, Paul is, is um, basically forced to plead his rights as a Roman citizen. He makes his appeal to Caesar in Rome. And Acts 27 is the part of that journey from, from uh, Caesarea to Italy. It's the final journey of Paul recorded in the book, that final journey in Acts. And so I'm going to read just a few verses Uh, Beginning in verse 21 of chapter 27, this is Paul talking to the crew of the ship in the middle of the storm, beginning in verse 21. Finally, Paul called the crew together and said, men, you should have listened to me in the first place and not left Crete. You would have avoided all this damage and loss, but take courage. None of you will lose your lives, even though the ship will go down. For last night an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me. And he said, don't be afraid, Paul, for you will surely stand trial before Caesar. What's more, God in his goodness has granted safety to everyone sailing with you. So take courage, for I believe God. It will be just as he said, but we will be shipwrecked on an island. When we were studying through the book of Acts on Wednesday night last year, actually earlier this year and last year, one of the things we noticed in chapter 27 was there was a problem. As you're reading through the book and you get to this, these final chapters, you begin to wonder, why is so much time and so much space and so much attention to the detail given to the story? It doesn't really seem to fit exactly with all the rest of the book of Acts. Yes, we know Luke the writer of Acts was, was a doctor, a, a historian. He was, he was keenly interested in details and being precise, and he provides a lot of that in his gospel and in this book of Acts. And so we know that about Luke. And yet, the length of this story that begins in chapter 27 and really runs through the second half or the first half of chapter 28, it seems as though the length of it is out of proportion to its value. And so we have to ask this question as good students of God's word, what what was the message Luke was trying to convey to us, the reader? Why did he take so much time to devote to the story? Why so much detail? What were the major lessons? What does it have to do with us today? Well, the first 
is something we've already been singing about this morning. It's something we, we already have, have been looking at even in the, as recently as the last sermon series. And that is, this is an, another example of the providence of God. I told you uh, three weeks ago that all throughout Scripture you can see the providence of God at work. Of course, we define the providence of God uh, as how God orders all the events in creation, nature, and history, so that the ends for which God created them will be realized in due time. It's basically God's care for the world, God's action in the world to ensure that, yes, there are secondary causes that God allows. He allows events in nature. He allows human beings to have free will. And yet, in, the, in spite of, and even in the midst of, and in, in through those events and those secondary causes, God is bringing about human history to his intended end. Nothing will undermine God's purposes in the world. God's providence is clearly seen in the story of Acts. God is the one, as Paul says in the beginning of his letter to the Ephesians, he is the one who works all things after the counsel of his will, who works all things, even evil things, even destructive things, for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purposes. God's providence is clearly at work in all the circumstances of Paul's life and in his ministry, especially in this story of him on a ship, out to sea, in the midst of a storm, this chapter fits within the larger story, as I've already alluded to, that begins back in chapter one, chapter 21, of Paul's final journey from Caesarea to Rome. This was God's goal for Paul. This was Paul's goal for himself. He, said, he says in, in, in Acts chapter 19, Paul says, yes, the Holy Spirit is leading me here, but after that, I intend to go to Rome. Paul has it on his radar to go to Rome. He wants to, to present the gospel on the biggest stage in the world. And Jesus, in chapter 23 himself, says, yes, you must preach the gospel there. But all the circumstances of Paul's life, from those chapters on, seem to be preventing this from, being, from taking place in Paul's life. The sequence is startling. All the way back in chapter 1, he's arrested in Jerusalem. There's a mob waiting for him. They accuse him falsely. Luke says that they grabbed him and they dragged him. This is a, a forceful type of seizure. They grab him. They take him out of the temple. The door is slammed behind him. He's threatened to be killed. Sent to various authorities. Subjected to endless trials. The threat upon his life was so great that when they transferred him from Jerusalem to Caesarea, they had, it had to be an armed, by an armed military convoy. The threat upon his life was so grave that he had to be imprisoned, not just because he was a criminal, but for his own safety for two years. And even as the assassination plot by the Jews continued to threaten his life, he had to be shipped away to Rome. And on the sea... He experienced the worst of storms. He was faced being killed by the Roman soldiers that escorted him. He even was bitten by a poisonous snake. One thing after the other, the story goes on and on and on. All of these stories, including the, the harrowing tale of him at sea, all of these are recorded by Luke so that we would share Luke's amazement at Paul's safe transfer to Rome. Paul had no business making it there in one piece. He experienced more in these chapters than, than probably all of us have experienced in our whole lives together in terms of life-threatening situations that would prevent us from reaching a particular goal. Despite all these things, however, nothing could stop him from arriving at his God-planned, God-promised destination. God always brings about his intended ends. Jesus' words were true. In Acts 23, 11, he says, Be encouraged, Paul. Be encouraged. Just as you have been a witness to me here in Jerusalem, you must preach the good news in Rome as well. The Lord said it. Therefore, it would happen. There is no force in nature. There is no force in supernature that can stop or undermine the plans and purposes of God. And therefore, since that is true, you and I can face storms. Whether it's a, a literal, physical storm of nature, or whether it's a, a, a metaphorical storm in your life. And many of you undoubtedly are in a storm this morning. 
you came here feeling the, the blast of hurricane force winds upon your life. And your circumstances are all different. They're all unique, and yet they're all the same. They're the circumstances of life, shared life, that we all share something in common in this broken world. There's sin in the world. There's brokenness in the world. And we suffer as a result of that. All of us go through storms. And yet, we can face them. Because we have a God who is faithful. A God who is sure. A God who has a plan for the world and a plan for your life that will not be disrupted, even by the secondary causes he permits. And that is especially true for those who can say with Paul, he is the God to whom I belong and the God whom I serve. If those words from Acts 27, 23 define your life, you can be sure that no matter what you're facing, no matter what you're going through, you have nothing to fear. On a ship, doomed at sea, God reassured Paul, do not be afraid. My purposes for you are sure. His purposes are sure. Do you believe that this morning? Do you believe that? Do you bank your life on that truth? Sure, it's easy to believe that. It's easy to praise God when the hurricane takes a southward turn and we're spared. It's easy to think that, isn't it? It's easy to, to come to church and praise God for his faithfulness and for his, his provision and his protection for all the things that we've thanked him for, rightly so this morning. It's easy to do that when the storm goes the other direction. And yet, what happens when the storm hits us square in the face? Elizabeth City very easily could have been Wilmington. Hertford could very easily have been New Bern. Yes, the problem became someone else's problem, but what if it had come to us? Would we still have banked on the promises of God? Would we still have been confident in that his purposes are sure, that he is sufficient to carry us through whatever? Would we have said, I will not fear? It's a tough question that, that all of us have to answer, especially in light of, of a life-threatening situation. Will I praise God in the midst of the storm? Will I worship God? Will I trust God through the storm from beginning to end? Do I truly believe in God's providential care? Church, the storms in life, the literal ones, the metaphorical ones, force us all to evaluate our confidence in the providence of God. It tests our faith. It's interesting, Paul did arrive in Rome, didn't he? We know from, from Acts that he did make it to his destination. Jesus said he was going to make it, and by golly, he made it. In spite of all those things that happened, Paul was safely transferred to his destination, but it was in a manner that he could never have in anticipated. He didn't arrive there as some great apostle welcomed by the masses, ready to preach the gospel on the world's greatest stage. You know, Paul arrived as a criminal of the state. He arrived a prisoner. I doubt that's what he had in mind as he pictured himself preaching the gospel in the capital of the world. And that really brings us to the second major thing that I want to cover, and the last major thing I want to say about why Luke provides this story in the broader story from 21 to the end. Why does Luke give us all this, des all this detail? Why does Luke give us all this minutia? Well, it's to reinforce to us the truth about Paul and also the truth about our lives. That is, the manner of Paul's arrival, the way in which he arrived, had the effect of enhancing his witness. It enhanced his witness. If Paul had gone to Rome in any other way, say he just, you know, decided to walk there or catch a, a, a carriage or however, how, the, the most efficient way to, 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 to do transportation in the first century, take a ship, whatever it was. If he had, a, if he had chosen to go, go to Rome on his, the way that he would have thought would be best, the chances are he never would have made it all the way to Caesar. Now maybe he would have. I, we don't know for sure, but probably not. And so with that in mind, we can say with confidence that it's not in spite of his arrival as a prisoner, but because of his arrival as a prisoner, that the reach of his witness was expanded. Paul was able to go 
to the, to the highest court in the world because of his circumstances. Because he was a prisoner, Paul was given audience with Caesar. He was able to witness to Christ in the presence of the world's most prestigious person, in the world's most prestigious court. And I happen to, to be one who believes that things like hurricanes and other unplanned or unforeseen events and circumstances, I believe those provide you and me the exact same opportunities. To be able to be, to do, to serve in ways otherwise perhaps un- impossible. To be able to reach out, to be a beacon of hope in life to those in need. Opportunities to rise to the occasion to meet great natural evil with even greater supernatural love. That's why we're here, church. We're not here this morning to enjoy the comfort of an air conditioner that's that's working properly, thanks be to God. We're not here to enjoy a lovely worship service, to just get my Jesus fix for a Sunday morning and then so I can go back to my life for the rest of the week to get that recharge. We like to use that, or the refill. I go to the gas station to refill my car. I go to church to refill my heart. That's not why we're here. Sure, there's, that's part of it, of course. We do want to worship God and we're grateful for the air conditioning and the comfortable seats. But we're here ultimately to be the hands and the feet and the voice of Christ's mercy and truth and life to the world around us. And if we respond to the promptings of the Holy Spirit, this storm, Hurricane Florence, can become an avenue by which this church here, right here at the the, the beginning of of the little river on the county line between Perquimans and Pasquotank, this little church right here can expand its witness and its reach in unique and in life-giving ways. No one wanted a hurricane to hit the coast of North and South Carolina. But through this event, God is going to raise up people, you and me, to make a difference for the lives of others in a way that perhaps we never could otherwise. That's not to say God is the cause of hurricanes. God permits natural events to occur through his permissive will. It's not to say that God is the source of evil. God, of course, is not the source of evil. But it is to say that even in the midst of evil, even in the midst of of natural disasters, God is at work to do something even greater. That's the hope we place in in the God who, through his providence, is at work, intimately involved in every aspect of the world. And if we would yield ourselves to him, submit ourselves to him to say, you know what, My, my life wasn't really inconvenienced in the end of things. But you know what, I'm willing to let my life be inconvenienced now. For the sake of another. Those who are yielded to God can be used in unique and life-giving ways. Just like Paul. (laughs) Look at the unique way Paul was used. And yet look what it cost him. He didn't show up in Rome as a great apostle that that everyone embraced. He, He arrived as a criminal of the state. Another way that Paul's circumstances and trials enhanced his witness is not just through his expanded reach, but I believe the character of his witness was enriched. Consider all that he went through. It's hard to imagine how he managed to endure nearly five years of of what we would probably view as relative inactivity. This one who, who for the years prior had spent his life traveling around the known world, spreading the gospel, exhausting all of his time and energy and his, his livelihood for the sake of the gospel, and yet And we get to these chapters, it's five years of of what seems to be just sitting around. Two years in Caesarea, he sat in that prison cell. Six months it took him to travel from Caesarea to Rome. It's not that far by our standards today. It's a quick, it's a, it's a, what, an hour flight at best. Took him six months. And when he got to Rome, he spent two years in house arrest. (laughs) Five, almost five years, the man whose life had been marked by going and going and going, was now marked by sitting around feeling like I'm doing nothing. And yet, despite all the other things he could have been doing, his prison letters, the ones in the New Testament too, the Ephesians, the Philippians, the Colossians, and Philemon, are perhaps the most remarkable letters he wrote in the entire New Testament. 
and things to the history that Luke provides us in the book of Acts. You can't read his prison letters without sensing how much their substance owes something to his experiences. He can write from his prison cell on the sovereignty and purposes of God. He can write on the person and work of Christ. He can write on the fullness of the Godhead, the nature of the church, Christian conduct and character. Paul could write on topics like humility and contentment and unity and forgiveness because of the great trials the Lord was able to form something in his life. Because of those things he experienced, the Lord was doing something deep in his heart, cultivating something on the inside that could not be formed otherwise. And his perspective is really it's, it's something that can teach us something today. In chapter 27, these verses that I read earlier, Paul didn't look at the storm as an opportunity to question God's character, but rather as an opportunity to discover it. The world looks at disasters and says, the presence of evil in the world is a reason to deny the existence of God. But the Christian says, no. The storms of life, the presence of evil in the world, are opportunities for us to learn more about the goodness of God. You don't even know what evil is unless there's some standard of good to compare it to. And the greatest of evil in the world only demonstrates and proves and reinforces an even greater good. And Paul says, yes, in this event, our lives seem to be at risk. Yes, in this event, God is doing something greater than, than what our lives represent. But through it, God is also revealing his goodness to you. He calls the crew and says, The God to whom I belong, the God that I serve, is going to spare your lives. This wasn't a boat full of Christians. (laughs) This is a boat full of pagans. And Paul says this storm that is affecting you is going to be a, a, a means of revelation to the goodness of God for you. God reveals his goodness in the midst of evil. And those who put their trust in him will always discover his goodness and his faithfulness. He will never disappoint. He will never go back on his word. Things will always take place exactly as he says they will. Paul learned all this firsthand. He learned this through personal experience. In his circumstances that he went through in Acts 21 all the way to the end of the book, enabled him to leave a richer spiritual legacy for all posterity through his writings. Writings that we're still benefiting from today. The writings of of the New Testament, the, the letters that Paul wrote, they weren't just teachings that just magically descended from the sky one day. These weren't just some dictated letters that just appeared and Paul wrote, he signed his name at the end. No, these letters were spirit-inspired wisdom and truth that resulted from the experience of a heart yielded to God, not yielded just once, but consistently through all the circumstances of life. And as a result of these things and his, his unwavering hope in Christ, he was left a better man, a better servant, a better witness as a result. You and I have witnessed firsthand the goodness the mercy, the provision of God. He has revealed his character to you and to me this week. So what are we going to do as a result of that? Yes, we rightly praise him for his goodness. We rightly praise him for his protection, for his provision. But we know about these things not just from someone else's story. We know these things because we've experienced them. And through these things, I believe just as he did for Paul, that he's forming in your heart and in my heart something that will enhance our witness to the world around us. The storm has not only created an opportunity for our reach for the gospel to be expanded, it's prevented It's presented us an opportunity for our own witness to be enriched as we share it with the world. You and I can declare God is good. God is merciful. God is true. He is worthy to be praised because he has been good and merciful and true to me. I've experienced it. I know what it means when he says, I am good. I have have 
received his abundant blessing in protection, in provision. And so you and I can take, take that into the world, that witness into the world, and say, let me show you what God is like. Let me show you. We have a unique opportunity for our reach for the gospel to be expanded and for the character of our witness to be enriched. And that starts this morning. It's already begun through the acts of giving and generosity represented on the table out there. But it's going to continue as we pray. Yes, this hurricane was a tremendous weather event that has impacted many lives, some forever. But you and I both know a God who's even greater. A God whose love can so transform a life that it can be changed for all of eternity. And so our prayer now turns to those who are still in the midst of the suffering. Even now, whole families, whole communities, a whole region of our country is experiencing devastation on a on an unprecedented level in some cases. And so you and I, our response matters, doesn't it? We are going to respond through giving, but we're going to respond through interceding. To be the people who can say, God is the one to whom I belong. God is the one I serve. And I'm going to let him use me according to his sure purposes for the world. So what we're going to do now as we wind down the worship service this morning is we're going to move into what I'm calling a season of intercession. And so I invite you in these these remaining moments to find a comfortable position. If you need to shift or adjust yourself in your seat, perhaps you would like to come and kneel. That would be very appropriate in this time. If you wanted to come even now to kneel at this place of, of prayer, at this altar, not on your behalf, but on the behalf of those who are suffering, We're going to enter into an extended period of prayer. And I'm going to do my best to guide us through that time using Scripture to to let the, the truths of God's Word form how we pray for those around us. But I invite you not to just sit and passively listen, but in your own hearts, in your own minds, and in your own ways, pray to pray to God that He would provide relief, that He would provide life, that He would protect that he would sustain, and that lives would be saved, not just physical lives, but that salvation offered through Christ would be offered, even in the midst of a natural disaster. So let's turn our hearts now to this time of prayer. You're welcome to move about the worship center as you feel led, even now, and even as we start praying. Don't feel bound to your seat. You can come or go, however you feel led, whatever is comfortable, whatever is right. Let us move now into a time of prayer. The words of the old song are echoing in my head, Lord. Freely, freely you have received. Freely, freely give. Every one of us here this morning has freely received your grace, your love. We have all welcomed your protection and your provision. And Lord, in light of your great goodness to us and your great mercy to us, we want to take time to make this house a house of prayer and give. Give of our hearts, give of our our mouths, give of our minds, give of our time to you, but also on behalf of others. Lord, we intercede even now. We intercede for those affected by the storm. And we ask that they would come to know your love and your provision and your protection. We pray that those even now who are in a house with rising water or watching the the devastation of their homes from from a hotel room on TV, those who are grieving the loss of property or life, we pray that these would look to the Lord and his strength, that they would seek your face Always, Holy Spirit, cultivate in the hearts of people a hunger and thirst for you. We pray that that they would come to know the Lord our God who is in our midst. 
the mighty one who saves. Who, as Pastor Jeff has already reminded us this morning, rejoices over us with gladness. Who stills and quiets and brings peace to our hearts with his love. Who rejoices over us with loud singing. Lord, may they know that you are with them. It is you, O Lord our God, who holds our right hand. It is you who says, fear not, for I am the one who helps you. Impress upon the hearts of those impacted by this storm the promise of Isaiah 35, 4 that says, Tell everyone who is discouraged, be strong and don't be afraid. God is coming to your rescue. Lord, we lift to you those grieving loss that they would have the strength and endurance to rebuild the broken physical and emotional and spiritual places in their lives. Lord, do not be far from them. Be near. Be their strength. Be their comfort. Come quickly to their aid. And as they calculate and survey their losses, may they find in you a strength and a courage as they hear you say, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Thank you for the assurance of Isaiah 40, 31 that says, For those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Thank you, God, that you respond to the prayers of the destitute and you will not despise their plea. God, we lift to you those first responders and Volunteer rescue teams who are giving so generously of their time, of their provisions, of their care. Putting their lives on hold. Putting their lives on the line for the sake of others. It is a beautiful picture of your own self-giving love for us. We thank you in all our remembrance of them. They are an extension of your own love to those in need. We pray for their protection. We pray for their discernment, that they would make wise decisions with supernatural wisdom. We pray the prayer of Paul for the Colossian church in Colossians 1.11 that says, May they be strengthened with all power, according to your glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy. Lord, we lift to you whole communities that they would come together in this difficult time. That they would be able to overcome their differences. That we as a people would rediscover a love for neighbor that issues from a love for God. May the sinful barriers that we erect according to race and class and ethnicity be abolished. May our communities experience the fellowship offered in Christ alone, in whom there is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for all who are in Jesus Christ are one. God, may this church body demonstrate to the world the truth of who you are by our own diligence and intentional efforts to preserve the unity your spirit is cultivating here in our midst. May the world come to know who you are. May the world come to know we are Christians by our love for the world and for you. Lord, we lift to you the children, the elderly, and the vulnerable, that they would receive compassion and gentleness. We believe the words of 2 Kings 20, verse 5 that says, I, the Lord, have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Behold, I will heal you. Lord, when we are afraid, we put our trust in you. May this church, in our submission to you, imbibe the truth of James 1.27 that says, Pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and for widows in their distress. Give us a heart for the widow. 
Give us a heart for the orphan. Give us a heart for the refugee. Give us a heart for the displaced. Give us a heart for the shut in. Give us a heart for the lonely. Give us a heart for the poor. Give us a heart for the weak. That our loving care would extend even to the least of these. For Jesus, you said, I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. Lord, make us a people who are the very extension of your own hands and feet and life and love to those who are hurting and experiencing suffering and injustice in the world around us. We pray, Lord, for those who lead, those who make decisions, that they would have humility, that they would have wisdom, that wisdom which comes from above, that is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, without uncertainty or insincerity. Make our leaders, Lord, to know and follow your ways. We pray against anyone who would exploit this crisis for personal or political or financial gain. We pray that by your spirit you would restrain the evil in the hearts of looters. That people who have lost much would not lose any more than necessary. But rather people would be redirected to, to acts of mercy, acts of charity, acts of love. May our leaders... God, listen to advice. Listen to the people they serve. But most importantly, may they accept instruction from you. That they may gain wisdom for the present and for the future. And lastly, and perhaps most importantly, we pray that persons, men and women, boys and girls, would come to know the hope and salvation offered through Jesus Christ. May Hurricane Florence go down in history not as one that produced record rainfall or record-breaking flooding and devastation. Lord, may Hurricane Florence go down in history as a storm that revealed your great goodness and grace and mercy. Reveal yourself, Lord, as you did for those on the ship at sea with Paul. Your goodness, your grace, your mercy and love. In the midst of this great evil, Lord, may we discover your even greater love. We pray that men and women would learn to, to trust in the Lord with all their hearts and, and, not only, and not rely on their own insight, but in all their ways may they learn to acknowledge you, for you make straight our paths. Father, we pray for the lost and our heart's desire for them is that before and above all else, that they may be saved. May your saving grace transform the life of someone even as we pray. And in the days and weeks to come, as we organize as a, a, a community and as a state and as a region, as a country, teams of mercy and rebuilding and recovery, Lord, permeate and saturate every one of those teams with people that belong to you who can take not only the life-giving message of a community who cares about their, those around them, but the life-giving message of a God who gave his only son that we would have eternal life. May your gospel be expanded in its reach through the, the recovery efforts after the storm. May our, the character of our witness be enhanced and enriched as we proclaim to those around us what we've come to experience as the truth of your goodness and care. By the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, may those who belong to you hold unwaveringly to the hope that we profess. For the one who makes promises is faithful and true. May our light so shine before others that the world may see our good works and give glory to our Father in heaven. We desire none of the credit, none of the attention, none of the praise. Lord, may every can of food, every diaper, every bottle of water offered through us be offered in the name of Jesus. 
that you would receive the glory, that you would receive the honor, and that you would receive the praise. Lord, we lift all these prayers, not on our behalf, but on behalf of those who may not even be able to pray for themselves. And we do so with confidence because you are trustworthy and sure. You care about every one of our needs, no matter how great or small. And we are looking to you in this time of crisis and need. Lord, make yourself known to us, but also through us. We pray all these things in the mighty and powerful name of Jesus. To the glory of God the Father, amen and amen. Jeff, please come, and he's already in place.